Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia and we are live streaming today. Yay! I was pretty excited to get live streaming today because, <clears throat> well, it's been a couple of days. Um, it's been before Christmas, I took a couple of weeks off, I think two weeks, we probably skipped, I don't know, maybe three live stream sessions. Um, and we are back. Um, we are looking at a Halloween pennant dragonfly. So, um, there's going to be a couple of things that we notice about the dragonfly. For instance, a lot of times in dragonflies' heads, their eyes can kind of, um, kind of push in a little bit. So you'll notice that the eyes are just a little bit concave. Um, <coughs> and we'll talk about a variety of characteristics. But I just, before we, um, I think before we really get into sketching this dragonfly, I wanted to show you just a couple of, I guess, dragonfly terms, um, whether our pennant, uh, whether our Halloween pennant's gonna have them or not. <coughs> um. Oh, yeah. All right. So Susan says that she enjoys the Halloween pennants. Um, they are, they do tend to be fairly brightly colored, kind of a bright orange. And they have these really pretty, um, they have this really pretty coloration on its wings. So I just wanted to switch over, sorry, I just wanted to switch over to my, um, table camera really quick and show you this these couple of notes that I had from uh, from a class when I was learning about dragonflies and how to identify them we were required to know these three families which are supposedly the most common families although cordiality isn't on this list and can be confused with some of them um, so there is another family that is fairly common. But these ones are the ones that we learned. Um, gomphids, um, are easily identified because their eyes do not meet on the top of their head. So when you look at the head of a gomphid, of a gomphid dragonfly, you're going to see the eyes are separated at the top. Whereas both aeshnids and libelulids are going to have eyes that meet on the top of their heads. All right, so that's characteristic number one to separate the gomphids from everybody else. All right, the characteristic that will help you separate aeshnids from libelulids is this is this vein that we call the br the brace vein. Um, and if we're looking at the wing of a dragonfly. You'll see right about here, there's a little colored section. We call that the stigma. And then if there's a little itty bitty vein that runs parallel to the stigma, that's a brace vein. And aeshnids have them and libelulids don't. So I just wanted to kind of get us started off in the right foot. Um, and then there's this other kind of fun characteristic. I sketched it right here, so I figured I'd show you this before we got going. Whoops. Alright, so Libelulid, the skimmers, this is what family our Halloween pennant is in. Um, so right here, this darker spot is the stigma. If there was a vein coming off right about here underneath the stigma, that would be a brace vein. But libelulids don't have a brace vein, so you won't see that. Um, this is an example of a brace vein right here. So you can see this is the stigma, and then there's this diagonal line that continues down past it. That is going to tell you an aeshnid. Or uh, Darner is the common name for those guys. And so also in the wings of libelulids, we'll see a downward pointing triangle, a left pointing triangle, and this is what we call the boot. Um, it has a scientific name, but we, I always just know it as the boot. Um, there are a couple of families that have them, but we're definitely going to be able to see the boot in our Halloween pennant today. So those are just some things to look out for, and I'm going to be, um, pointing them out too when we get there, but I figured. 
figured that this was, um, it's best to kind of show you them. Yes, so the Libelulids are the skimmers, um, Aishnids are darners, and Gomphids are clubtails. If you are going to write those down, Aishnids are darners. Gomphidae are club tails. And then the Libelulids, which are the family that we're going to be working in today, are the skimmers. Dragonflies scientific name is Celithemus Eponina. In case you would like to type write that down on our paper. page down so that we can see it better. Oh man, I hope that you saw it all right. Sorry, I was catching up on my, I was catching up on my chat. All right, good. I hear a yes. We are able, we were able to see it okay and got all the information we needed. That makes me happy. I, uh, I, I, I forgot to read comments for a moment, but we're back. I wondered if you use the type of pencil you do because I've recognized the sound over the past few months. Oh, that's funny. Halloween pants. Some of, I, you've seen unicorn club tails around the local ponds. Otherwise, mostly green darners and skimmers. Yeah, I am going to be bringing my binoculars out this year and really trying to um, learn some of my dragonfly identifications. Uh, they're one of those that can be a little bit tricky um, unless you get them under a, like... They have to be color identified like butterflies and those are a little bit trickier for me because there aren't like set um, characteristics. It's having to know each individual to species and that's a whole lot to know. So we're going to just zoom in right here on the head for a moment. <clears throat> and I'll show you what's happening. Um, the head is turned just a little bit, so we're looking up at the right eye. This is the compound eye. This is the one that has so many little itty bit oopsies. Ha. That was one of my pictures. <laughs> All right, so this is our compound eye. It has very, 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 so many little itty bitty eyes inside of it. Those little itty bitty eyes are what we call... They're omatidia, and I'm going to have to get rid of that text and add a new one. Let's see if I add the same text box back if it's fixed. Good. Alrighty. So omatidia, that is each, um, omatidia is the word for all of those individual eyes inside of the compound eye. Um, not all of them are focused the exact same. So some of the eyes in the front will be kind of, um, 
farsighted, some of the eyes in the back will be nearsighted, and so between all of the eyes, they have a good focus range from really close up to far away. Um, but they have lots and lots of omatidia to do that with. If you are going to write the singular for that word, it is omatidium. Now, if we look right around here, I believe I'm going to have to change, shift the focus just a little bit. There it is. This is the antenna. So it is very, very short. It almost is hair-like. I would probably call it cetaceous because it's a hair-like antenna rather than filiform. Um, you probably could argue both words, but it's this little itty bitty short antenna um, and it's very hair-like and there's going to be one on either side. Up here on the front, that's where our mouth parts are going to be starting. Um, and then something that I've always loved about dragonflies is the long spines on the tibia. You can see these over here. When a dragonfly is flying, they're going to be, they're going to hold two legs like this, two legs like this, and two legs like this. And it kind of creates this little basket so that when they're kind of zooming and flying through the air, they can just catch mosquitoes in their basket and eat a whole bunch of them at once. <laughs> Or catch a big flying insect and eat it. Can we get a zoom in on an omatidia? Of course we can. That's what I'm here for. There you go. So a lot of times the individual omatidia just look like little spots that are that are shining light, but each one of those little dots is its own omatidium. Hey, do they have multiple segments after the split in the tarsus? Oh, you were checking for hairs in between the omatidia. No, dragonflies do not have hairs in their compound eyes. And did they collapse because they're dehydrated? Yes. Some dragonfly eyes are going to collapse when they pass away. Um, honestly, dragonfly specimens are so fragile that most people don't pin their dragonflies. Most people who are keeping dragonflies in a collection put them into an envelope uh, because they expect them to fall apart. They expect them to lose their heads and to, um, and to break into little pieces. Dragonflies are very, very fragile. And so... Um, to make sure that all the pieces stay together, people generally, uh, will just put a dragonfly, um, into, like, a clear envelope and staple it or heat it, um, heat it shut. We need to catch you a hair streak butterfly specimen. True. So the question is, are there multiple tarsal tarsus after the split? And the answer is no. The split and the tarsus happens here. Those are the those are two tarsal claws. It's just that the tarsal claws are really long. All right. So um, it almost looked like there were multiple segments, but I think that it's mostly because they have long tarsal claws and they have like a a double claw. I think we call them bifurcated when there's a double. They're just super cool. Yeah, exactly. They have extra spines. All right, I'm gonna get to, st I'm gonna start sketching. 
I've been too busy watching uh, and, and playing under my microscope, but this is good. left and just draw the right hand side of the wings unless I turn my paper sideways but I think that this will be better so I'm gonna go ahead and start off with keep in mind that my first sketch is always a very light kind of outline of the insect before I come back and add any of my details so starting off with a very light This is going to be my essentially my shirt starting shape. I'm going to create these two parentheses on the paper and close them. It's going to give me kind of a, a rounded rectangle shape. But then I want to add a piece up in the front that's going to be a part of its mouth. So that'll help me get a little bit of clarity on where we're going. Let's see. I'm going to get my sketch a little closer to the camera. works for me. All right, when we're, um, when we're connecting our thorax to our head, um, dragonflies have very similar heads to, or even more fragile heads than flies will have. So they still have a, almost like a peg that goes into their head. And their head can swivel really, really well, but that also means that their head can fall off really, really easily. There's a separation in between the head and the thoracic region that is only connected by this little itty bitty peg. And then in our thorax, we're going to kind of start narrow and we're going to almost widen out a little bit. to where the wings connect and then we're going to close up the box by making it a little narrower and that's going to be our thoracic region. Now uh, dragonflies can be a little bit tricky because it almost looks like the front wings are on the second segment of the thorax or on the second third. But um, all of the thoracic segments are angled. So if I had the head here, the pronotum actually comes on an angle, and then the mesonotum and the metanotum. So this whole segment right here is the is would be considered the first segment of the thorax. From here all the way over to right around here at the end of the first pair of wings. All right, now we're going to scooch on back and check out some. So what triangle between the eyes makes me think of a nose? Does it contain? So what triangle between the eyes? So that triangle between the eyes, does it contain more eyes? That's funny. No, I do not believe that it does. Um, that triangle in between the eyes is just the part of the head that doesn't have eyes. <laughs> um, we'll be able, we might be able to turn the specimen to see that when we zoom in. The thoracic segments are sort of stacked, aren't they? So, yeah, they're from the front to the back, they're stacked. If I was to... Here, I'll just give you a really quick sketch. If we were looking at the thorax from the side, say this was the head here, and we have the big compound eye, the first segment of the thorax it angles this way. And then the second segment angles. So where it looks like this first segment is really long, it's just because it's on an angle. That's the angle I was talking about. Alright, let's count abdominal 
final segments. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and the claw. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. My camera doesn't have as wide of a view as my microscope does, so sometimes um, I'm seeing more on my microscope than you can see on the camera. But um, the abdomen is nice and long and thin. You can see where the colors used to be. Dragonflies, unfortunately, lose all of their color when they pass away. Um, we're lucky to have even these stripings um, still around. So with me, dragonflies, I feel like are almost better off having their pictures taken than being collected because they're so likely to fall apart and they, their colors fade. Are the abdominal segments consistent across all dragonflies? Yes, Susan, exactly. Those diagonal stripes that you see are running along the segment lines. That is, um, that's a, that's a keen observation. Um, are the abdominal segments consistent across all dragonflies? I'm not sure. I'd love to give you an answer, but I'm not sure. Um, I think that they are at least within two segments of each other. Um, in some other insects, the females have more segments than the males, but I don't know with dragonflies. Uh, you asked even the iridescent ones. Like, do even the iridescent dragonflies and damselflies fade and lose their colors? Um, a lot of times what I'm, when I think of an iridescent, yes, referring to color loss, a lot of times when I'm talking about, when I'm thinking about iridescence, I'm thinking about damselflies, um, like the emerald damselflies, and those do hold their iridescence. So if they're iridescent, that really pretty green blue or green purple color, um, those get to keep their color, but they're the only ones that do. Any of the bright green and yellow ones, the red ones, the blue ones, the green ones, they all fade to brown. There is, a, some people say that there is a way to save the coloration. Let me go ahead and get this sketch first. Um, I want to pull the specimen over here so that we can look at it in its entirety. You can see um, how long our wings are in comparison to the body. Um, and it gives you an overall view. We can even do this if you would like. If you would like to screenshot our friend here, um, do so now. All right. Yes, exactly. The ebony jeweling damselfly looks gorgeous, and I love them. And I have a couple of those in my collection, too. So if we wanted to go on a slight detour, we could, um, if we wanted to go on a slight detour, we could look at the ebony, um, the ebony damselfly next. Ooh, is that a widow skimmer and a, and 12 spotted skimmer? Admittedly, I didn't identify the other two, which is also why we're not drawing them. Um, that's what they look like. They were just in the same box. All right. 
right, so I'm going to give myself a nice long abdomen, just keeping it nice and thin because I will be coming back and subdividing it and giving it the claw. Let's see. I had mentioned nine, I believe. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, That works for me. All right, so I have the length of my dra dragonfly's body. I'm going to go in and get the um, overall sketch of our wings here, and then we'll be able to put our wing venations, and we'll be able to look at the wings. Um, and I can give you a number of the... Uh, words number uh, some of the vocab that goes along with our friends here so keep in mind that because you've got those diagonals coming up we've got the front wings but then the hind wings are going to because they are kind of stacked right on top of each other um they're gonna connect in a very similar place so if you almost give yourself one two three four and a little square up here then you'll be able to know where your hind wings are gonna be going in um, and these guys, the hind wings, are just as long as the front wings, but then they have this lobe on the bottom. So just making sure that the hind wing has that nice wide lobe coming down. That's also going to help us fit the boot when we get there. All right. I'm pretty happy with the scar, with the start of our sketch here. There's my eraser. Perfect. All right. Um, I want to get it zoomed in so that I can finish my head sketch. Is the claw an egg depositor? It is not. Um, the claw is a, is a part for the boy. It's to hold the girls. So a lot of times the female dragonflies, um, their egg laying device or their ovipositor looks more like a sword or a spine coming off of the end of their abdomen, whereas males are going to have what look like pinchy parts at the end. That's where they hold the ladies. Wings are attached to the first and second segments out of, of every insect. We're looking at the wrong, I was like, that, that the head look, doesn't look right. We were looking at the wrong specimen. There we go. So our eyes, because it is a skimmer, a libel, because it's a libelulid, uh, the eyes are going to meet dorsally on the top of the head. So you can go from the edges of our head all the way to the center. And then you want to do that on both sides, trying to keep them fairly even. But you're going to have that good overlap here. There is going to be a little bit of extra head um, without eyes behind the eyes and in front of. There we go. There's also, you'll notice that little bit of a color change, that yellow part up there. Um, that is going to be a part of its mouth. Um... So, they have, Susan, I think, maybe it was Susan earlier, she had mentioned that you ha we had that almost that little triangle, and she was wondering if there were any eyes in that region. And there are not, but that region does have the antenna, right? So, um, it's a little bit more difficult to see it in this focus, but they are very short, and they're way up here in the front. And then we also have that mouth part. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to create this central um, 
line and then divide it in two. Yeah. Something like that to start our head. But then obviously because we have so many omatidia in here, you want to make sure that that's a really, really fine cross hatching uh, so that you have lots and lots and lots of eyes in here. I haven't dove down into the science of eyes and sight and color too thoroughly yet, but there's all types of really interesting science about the colors of which the colors that dragonflies can see. Because um, I believe even some of the omatidia see different t see like different shades or are or are specialized in different shades of colors. <clears throat> Birdscaping, I am glad that you're enjoying yourself. Thank you for subscribing. All right, something you may notice, normally my insects are pinned through the right-hand side of the, um, through just off the center to the right. When you pin a dragonfly, you pin it directly through the center of its body because you're spreading its wings. So any insects like butterflies and dragonflies where you're spreading their wings, you pin in the center of the body. That's not only to make sure it stays balanced, but also so that you don't have as much of a fight with one side of the muscles, of the wing muscles, than the other side. All right, so we've got this peg right here that's long and thin, is and is going to, um, and is going to kind of go up into that into the dragonfly's head and help my head pivot a little bit. Um, pivot, pivot, and then from here you have to kind of imagine it coming up towards you. It's getting bigger, um, not only because it's a little bit wider, but because it is coming up towards you just a little bit. Up here on the top, it stays pretty wide, and then it, and then after those little four squares, it gets slightly n more narrow. So you have a, end up with a shape that huh, it makes it reminds me a little bit of a barrel, barrel shaped. All right, um, you can even see some of that musculature in. Uh, right here that's going to be helping with, um, that's going to be helping with, uh, flight. <clears throat> All right. I want to make sure that the outline of my wing is where I want it. So with the front wing, something that I want us to notice is that there is almost like a lobe This is what I want to show everybody. <clears throat> and there's a word for it. This is the wrong book. So, um, right here, I think we call it the no I think we call it the node. Um, but I just wanted to double check by looking it up really fast. Um, yeah. Sometimes people call it the nodus, N-O-D-U-S. I've always just called it the node. And that is right here. Where's Terry? There's Terry. All right. Right here. This is the node. Um, it kind of divots a little bit in our wing here and then continues forward. There are a variety of um, characteristics. Sometimes the keys will have you count how many cross veins there are um, before the node. Sometimes you're comparing certain veins to where the node is. So it's an important where it's an important one to know if you're going through and identifying dragonflies in a key. Notice fancy Latin sounding node. Exactly. <laughs> uh, it just depends on who wrote the key. Some people call it the node, some people call it the notice. 
and then if we just go to the, all the way to the end of the wing, right here, where it looks shiny, right here, that is what we call the stigma, spelled S-T-I-G-M-A. Um, and most dragonflies are going to have a stigma also. It's this um, colored section generally on the top of the front wing. And if you zoom in right here to the base of the stigma and there is a cross vein that crosses right here, you know that it's an aeshnid. But this one doesn't have one. You see the cell continues all the way through. So that tells me that it's a skimmer or a libelulid. Do damselflies have a stigma too? I would have to look at a dra at a damselfly. I the thing is I don't remember seeing a stigma in, for instance, the ebony jewel wings because they're all one color. They definitely have a node, though. They have a, they have an M3 vein. Theirs is a little bit more complicated. <clears throat> Damselfly wing venation is more complicated than dragonfly wing venation. A lot of times in dragonflies, we're just looking at shapes. So if you see, I was mentioning we were going to find a po downward pointing triangle. It's right here. All right, so our wing starts off with this lobe, and it's going to stop a little bit, and that's where the node is, and then it continues on. So it's just this little kind of end in the arch. So that's going to be my front wing, and then it looks like my hind wing, I'm just going to angle it down slightly so that they're not together. But I was pretty happy with the outline of my hind wing, so I'm just shifting it a little bit to fit on my paper. And I'm going to go ahead and erase any of these light lines that I don't need anymore, because they are going to be getting in the way when I really start digging into this wing venation. So... I was hoping to show us from the base of the body all the way up to the node. Yay! All right, that works for me. So right about here, that's our node. I'm going to create this darker space here and the vein that comes down. And then from here, I'm going to bring it all the way back to the base of the wing. And then just take the, in here and give myself those cross veins. Now, I wish I remembered all of the, there are so many bug words. Sometimes, sometimes I don't remember them all, ladies and gentlemen. We call them the antinodal cross vein because they're before the notice. Okay. If you ever see this, how many antinodal cross veins do you have? That's what you're talking about here. Antinodal just meaning before the node, and then cross veins, meaning veins that are crossing this guy right here. So it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, approximately nine antinodal cross veins. <clears throat> All right, that's um that's one characteristic that's gonna be important for you to look at and recognize. Um, I'm just going to start. I kind of wanted to get. Because those ones don't matter. That's fine. All right. So the rest of these down here don't matter as much, but I want to get kind of the idea down. So I'm just going to start from here where this vein loops down off of our cross veins. And I'm going to take it, looks like, all the way out. And then 
I'm just going to run a couple of these lines parallel and give myself a whole bunch of cross veins. So at this point, I'm not counting every single vein. Um, I'm just trying to get the overall shape of the wings. Now, it is important that downward-facing triangle that's broken up into three segments, I am going to make sure that I get hit him in here. So grabbing it like this and then dividing it up into three. That triangle is definitely a part of the important wing venation. And then after this, down here, instead of it being a whole bunch of cross veins, you can see it almost evolves down into like a hexagonal patterning. So you can take a number of lines that go down and then kind of just start to connect them and give yourself a give yourself this type of pattern here and it'll uh, it'll work out in your favor all right and you can see these dragonfly dragonfly wing venation is insanity right um you're never going to name all of these veins uh but you can look at them and attempt to get it here we go now we can see the end I'm on the edge. All right, so starting here, we're going to come all the way up, and we end in that stigma up here at the top, that really, really pretty stigma. Um, I'm just going to take this stigma and shade it in a little bit. And then we have a number of cross veins here. And this just evolves into a whole lot of wing venation. All right, so that's how I'm going to, this is how I'm going to leave my wing. Um, it gives you the idea of where, what things are. I have those nine antinodal cross veins. I've got this downward pacing triangle that's a characteristic of the family. I did make sure I had the stigma, and I made sure that I did not put in the, um, the brace vein. There's no brace vein on that stigma. All right, let's look at our hind wing. Let's see. Is there is there a sort of accordion fold along the front edge of the wings between the first two rows of cells? I do not believe so. There isn't really an accordion fold. Yes, nine cross veins between the body and the node. I'm noticing that the markings along the fuzzy edges don't seem to start and stop specifically on veins and cross veins. I'm thinking it could be useful for sketching. Yeah, so um, if you were focusing less on the wing venation and more on just the colors, you could almost give yourself that darker striping here and it'll help you kind of align some of those veins if you wanted to kind of shade it in. Let's, let's see what this looks like. <clears throat> yeah, and the colorations on dragonfly wings generally don't follow the wing venations. Whereas so many other insects, they actually follow a pattern, you know, or they follow the lines. Dragonflies, they color outside of the lines. So it looks like she's got a darker spot right here, kind of above the triangle, and then one more stripe down at kind of where the, the base of the notice is. <clears throat> there you go. Do we know if there's a function to these darker spots besides looking cool? Mm. I don't know. I would love to know. Um, 
I've seen some fly wing, some like pictured fly wing venation when, that when they hold it just right, it makes them look like a spider, for instance. But I can't imagine a dragonfly holding its wings and making it look like a, anything. I think that they're just pretty. That's something I absolutely love about insects is that is the is the sheer diversity of them. All right. So, you can see that we have kind of the same uh, similar structuring on the hindwing, although funny enough, even though it looks like they have a node and you could almost say that there are antinodal or or cross veins bef before the node, when a key is talking about it, they're always talking about the front wing. Generally, we don't look at the node um, or um, if there's a stigma. We generally don't look at the node or the stigma of the hind wing. We're looking at it at, of the front wing. Now, on our hind wing, there is a very important shoe. And I'm not sure if you can see it, so I'm going to zoom in just a little bit better and get the shoe into focus. It's right about there. So if you look, this is the top of the boot. Uh, you come down, this is the heel, and this down here is the toe. So it comes down here and then comes all the way back up. Characteristic for the family. So if I was going to sketch that boot here, I would start it right about here. Come down and give yourself the heel. Ah! It's a little tricky. Needed to give myself the toe first. There's the toe. All right, well, something like that. You've got a boot in the wing. Not a snake in your boot. You've got a boot in your wing. We're going to scooch the microscope over just a little bit so we can see the end of the, um, well, that was a little bit more than a little bit, but we, I want to see the end of the hind wing here. So that's where the notice is, and that is where the stigma is, if you want to call it that on the hind wing. Yay! There. It's so pretty. Okay. Whee! Boop. Stigma. Boop, 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 boop. All right. Then a whole bunch of veins. And not only long veins, but a whole bunch of cross veins. It creates all of these very, very small net like patterning in the wings. And then if you wanted, we could give uh, the darker regions on the hind wings too. There is one longer band, and then what almost looks like, we'll scooch it back over so we can see the colorations. Is it possible that they are using their spots to camouflage? They could be. Maybe so that they're not so much of an obvious bug. I like that thought, too. Alright, let's get these guys darkened out just a little bit. I love that you ladies 
get to have have watched and identified dragonflies out in the wild too because i have mostly ever mostly only worked with them under microscopes i haven't spent a lot of time identifying them all the way to species like outside although i did get some awesome dragonfly and damselfly field guides that i'm really excited to put to good use so we'll have to start checking them off Hey, does the boot have a high heel? You know what? I was laughing about that because I do believe so. Um, but I wasn't going to point it out because normally the boot, like, in Libelulids, the heel is not part of the characteristic. But that definitely looks like there's a heel coming off of the end of that heel. Um, there looks like a heel, uh, like a, yeah, a heel coming off of the end of that boot. Funny. All right, so now all we need to do <clears throat> is get some abdominal segments on here. Ah, uh, yes, it was collected in Michigan in 2010, by the way. <gasps> Everything's okay. Just knocked the specimen off the table, but we're good. Nothing broke. No, don't drop it. I try not to. I really do. Every now and again, specimens end up on the floor and it makes me unhappy. Uh, one of my mantis flies just lost its entire, like, head and pronotal region along with its front two legs. Like, the whole front half of its body broke off and that made me sad. And I didn't even do anything. I think it just did it in the, maybe is the temperature change? I'm not sure. I was a little unhappy. I have to go in and glue it back together. All right, so now I'm looking at our abdomen. I do have approximately what I had kind of measured out, but I think what I'm going to do is make the abdomen just a little bit shorter and shorten up some of these segments. I didn't lose it. It just fell off the specimen. It's still in the bit box, so I have to glue them back together. I, when I find better, better specimens, I add to the collection. Um, I don't ever take specimens out of the collection unless they are kind of beyond help. Um, there's a mosquito in my collection that I will be taking out once I collect another mosquito. Because <laughs> I think it's only like, it's, it's not an entire bug. Um... But most of the time in my collection, I will glue specimens back together. This first segment looks a little bit kind of wider than all of the other ones. The, we're talking about abdominal segments now. So this first abdominal segment, it almost looks like it kind of gets wide and then narrows down like this. All right. And then from here on out, they're really long and nice and thin. Let's see, like something like this. One, two, three. Let's see. Four, five. I'm just kind of measuring it out to see what it looks like, and then I'll come back and clean it up. should be mostly fine. All right. So there are people who say that you 
you can save the colors on a dragonfly's abdomen and on a dragonfly's thorax if you collect them using the proper method. And to them, the proper method is taking the dragonfly and submerging it in acetone. Um, because, now I might get this wrong, but somehow the acetone actually preserves the color of the dragonfly along with pulling its muscles out fast enough or the grease of its body out fast enough that it doesn't degrade the color something like that so you actually put the dragonflies into acetone alive though um and then and then you move them over into your collection after they've passed and their color is saved but the acetone also makes these specimens very very fragile yeah It's not too hard to find a mosquito. It's just annoying to collect them and pin them because, you know, when you when you see a mosquito, you just kind of want to smash it, you know? <laughs> you have to remember to save it and then put it into a jar and then remember to get it out. And they have such long legs. They're like miniature crane flies. They lose their parts all the time. And see, Susan, that's where I've been at, is I've just been, recently, I've just preferred to, you know, take pictures of the specimens that I know that the colors aren't, aren't going to be great. Um, you know, if the colors are going to fade away, and I'm not using them directly for science at the very moment, I will use pictures rather than collecting it. So I actually have a, a giant number of moth pictures because I love taking pictures of moths during moth nights. Um, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. I need three more. And they're getting smaller and smaller at the end. Seven. Eight. And if we want, we can actually zoom into this um, claw at the end of the abdomen so that you can see this little guy right here. There you go. Wool grabbers. Pretty nifty. dragonfly sketches they're not one I, I I sketch all the time so we are in progress I think she's I think she's okay though um we can add the front leg if we would like damage on her eyes interesting I don't, I've never heard that before. It doesn't surprise me though, male dragonflies are aggressive. Hopefully both the claws are okay from the fall. They're all right. We did it. 
So I just wanted to give us one final look at this leg. Also, I wanted to get a chance to sketch it myself. I like that the hairs on the tibia start off being wide and then get narrower as they get towards the end of the tibia. It looks like she's got three tarsal segments and then the tarsal claws. So let's see, starting here in the front, we have a femur, nice long and thin. The tibia is moving forward. And the tibia, this is the one with all of these nice long hairs coming off of it that get narrower until the end. All right. And then you have three tarsal segments. The first one is actually really kind of short and ends on an angle. And then the next two are like longer rectangles. And we saw those claws, they're bifurcated or they've got an extra spine on them. That's pretty nifty. The book also points out that you wonder how dragonflies can tell right species to mate with when we can only ID them under a microscope. Exactly. Because insects are amazing. They have the ability to see colors we can't see. They have the ability to see details that we probably would never see. They have the ability to smell pheromones and scents that we can't smell. So, um, yeah. Males are, the male dragonflies are aggressive. They're actually one of the very, very few animals on the planet that will kill themselves for the purposes of mating. So, like, for instance, um, like big ram, big headed, like ram sheep, right? The males, they have these big horns and they headbutt and they fight over the ladies right? And that's just part of their evolution. That's part of their adaptation. And that doesn't kill them, right? It's just a fight. They prove who's, who's big and tough, and then they separate themselves. Dragonflies, um, after they mate, they're going to hold on to the lady and they will guard her while she goes and lays her eggs to make sure that she's laying the eggs from him, that, the, that, they're, that it's like his seed that is going to be being passed on. Um, and other dragonflies that want to mate with her will actually, like, dive bomb the male. And they will, uh, dive bomb with enough force that when they crash heads with one another, they can both die. <laughs> like, they regularly kill each other in an attempt to prove that they are strong enough to mate. Or in, a, in like... To, to try and fend off another male. Um, and that's unique in the animal kingdom because, you know, a lot of times that fighting that is occurring, it doesn't end in the death of the animal. But dragonflies have a really, they have a, a series of fascinating um, mating um, there's a whole bunch of fun mating stuff we could talk about with dragonflies, but it becomes a little bit rated X because they are a little, they're a little different. They're a little aggressive. I am pretty happy with our Halloween pennant. I hope that you got to see all of the Halloween pennant that you would like. You can feel free to let me know in the chat if there is anywhere else you would really like to, oops. Anywhere else you'd really like to see on our guy here? Um, we might be able... Hmm. I was hoping we were going to be able to at least see the mouth parts. So you could see what the chewing mouth parts of a dragonfly look like. But because the specimen is so odd, maybe I can hold it with my hands and show you. Sorry if it's a little bit shaky. I'm doing my best. So... 
right there where you see kind of a split in the head, that is the separation of the mandibles. So right around here, this is the mouth part. Up here, this is your upper lip or the labrum. Um, down here, you'll have the bottom lip or the labium. And then right here and right here that look like these wider rectangles, those are the chewing mouth parts. Um, Susan asks, do so they have no palps at all? I don't see any palps. I don't think so. Um, if they do have any type of like modified palps, they're likely inside. You know, have you ever watched a dragonfly eat? These parts all kind of open up. So it's possible that there's a palp kind of tucked down in there, but I'm not seeing any labial or maxillary palps. But I'm also not seeing the maxillary. I see the labrum, the labium, and the mandibles. Could I show it whole again? Of course I can. I can even show you all three of these guys whole. <laughs> Just a big chompy labrum and mandibles. Yep, exactly. So, yeah, I don't, I do not believe that they have any palps. Um, they're probably adapted and evolved. Maybe they've shrunk so far that we can't see them. Maybe they just don't use them anymore. Um, just like, even if you don't have chewing mouth parts, you still have a maxillary and a labrum and a labium. They just may be adapted and changed into different, bot into different mouth parts. You're welcome. Awesome. So I'm glad we got to see it whole again. This is my sketch. Um, <clears throat> I've got, I made sure to sketch those hairs on the legs, the eyes that match our triangles, the node, the stigma, you know, a long abdomen. Um, I think that if I was to do it again, I might make my thorax a little more narrow because I think my abdomen looks a little sickly, but I couldn't make it any longer because I was running out of paper shroom. Um, Susan says, I do think your others are a female cotton white tail and a widow skimmer. Thank you. Oh, did we get how many tarsal segments? Yes, uh, three tarsal segments. One short one with an angle and then two longer rectangles and then the double clawed tarsal claws. So three tarsal segments and then the claws. I'm going to have to write down your IDs, common white tail. And then I'll be able to go and look them up and confirm them. Thank you. All right. All right, I think we are all figured out. We're all, we're all done. Um, I had a great time sketching my dragonfly today. Uh, we are going to be coming into the new year. So when we live stream on Sunday um, at 4 p.m. Eastern, that is New Year's Day. All right. So the next time you'll see me, it'll be 2023. Wow, this year has gone fast. And you know what's really awesome is that we've been live streaming now for almost an... Well, I've been live streaming now for almost an entire year. I feel like I started maybe in mid-January or February. So I'm going to have to go back and look and see exactly when we started doing these live streams because we've been doing it for a good long time. 
Um, and I love it. So, I was also thinking that we might have to start doing, like, uh, maybe drawing on Thursday and then pinning on Sundays. Because I need to get pinning done. And I haven't been able to get it done because I've been doing other so many other projects. Um, but I want to get new specimens into the, into the collection so we can start sketching some newer guys. Um... And to do that, I've got to get some more guys on pins. So we're going to be doing that, and it's going to be a good time. Um, we'll have to figure out We'll have to figure out the scheduling on that. Yay! Happy New Year! So, thank you for hanging out with me today. I'm for Sketching the Dragonfly. We'll see you on Sunday. I also teach on a platform called OutSchool. I teach for students ages 5 to 8, 9 to 12. If you know a young one in your life that loves to talk about bugs or wants to talk about um, a certain type of bug with me, uh, you can always find me there. Um, keep in mind that please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, all of you who chat with me in the chat box, I know that you are subscribed because only subscribers could chat with me, so I thank you very, very much. If you want to reach out and send sketches or ask me bug questions or book me for a bug party or invite me to go on a nature hike with you, um, reach out at Trisha at theinsectopia.com. Um, and if you've really enjoyed yourself today, I, there are so many of you who already do this, so I, I almost um, don't want to ask every time, but that right there is my QR code. It um, gives me the opportunity to continue to do this and to thrive doing this. I really, it, um, it makes a difference in my life, and I really appreciate all of you who hang out with me and give me the opportunity to talk bugs for an hour or two every week. Um, I have a wonderful rest of your week. See you on Sunday and stay buggy. Bye.